Good evening. It's a tremendous pleasure to be here with you all. And when I was confronted with this theme of connecting cultures, I said just connecting doesn't make the whole sense that I want to make of this term cultures. And that really we need to also think about cultures confronting one another, transforming one another. And in that context, again, we could have gone all over the world. But I said, let's look within India. And when we look within India, there are many cultures out there that are connecting with one another, confronting one another, possibly transforming one another. And I thought, I'll just pick a couple of them. The culture of India's urban educated middle classes. In some sense, all of us. The people who've benefited the most of our 60, 65 years of independence, the people who've who essentially run the country in numerous ways. And in contrast to this middle class, I thought I'd look at the culture of India's political class. And right away, you can see that the slide illustrates what, what comes to mind when we think of the political class. We think of corruption and lust for power and floor crossing and scams and manipulations, deceit and vote banks and dynasty and horse trading and hate speeches, scandal. There's no shortage of negative thoughts that come to mind. Why? Why is there such a disparity between what's going on in the political world and what we all espouse and what all we would like to see become a reality. If you think about middle class values, what we cherish, what we'd like to aspire for, I mean, I'm just coming up with a list of topics that just came to mind. We value education. We emphasize merit, whatever that may mean. We are certainly professional. And in the last decade or two, we've discovered entrepreneurship. We also value security and safety. But today, we have a global outlook. At the same time, we're very risk averse. And fundamentally, we're apolitical. And that's the nub. That last word means that we don't really take on the challenges of making the system better. Why, why is this the case? Let's just take some simple illustrations, right? I mean, when you think about the middle class, it's a very, very wide spectrum. Nobody really knows how many Indians are middle class. There are, you know, McKinsey reports which say they're 200 million plus. They're going to be the big consumer market of the future. And there are other reports which say anyone who employs household help is middle class. All right. We don't know the magnitude, the number of people, the number of households, but... We have some rough hunches about who constitutes the middle class. And when we look at urban India, and we look at areas and constituencies where the educated middle classes are dominant, what do we see? We see voting percentages less than 50%. In contrast to, say, rural India, where people value the right to vote. You know, the vote is the weapon of the weak in some ways. And you find that you have 70, 80 percent turnouts in rural India. There's something else going on. We don't really participate. In fact, a couple of years ago, you would have seen this great movement around India called Jago Ray. And Jago Ray was all about getting the urban educated IT savvy Indians to enroll and participate, to just to exercise their franchise. You know, people are dying around the world for the right to vote. And we've had it, and we choose not to exercise it. We basically couldn't be bothered. And even if we wanted to be bothered, it turns out that not many of us actually know enough about the issues, the details of parties and their manifestos, or for that matter, of modern Indian history. In many ways, for us, we stopped studying history in high school. And that history ended in 1947. What's happened after that, we get in bits and pieces from the internet. Okay. That's it. And we haven't really engaged in understanding the issues 
and in going forth and sort of engaging with the critical burning issues of the day. The talking heads on TV, I don't think they really count. Uh, it's a different topic, it's the same shouting. Okay, anyway, you remember these people? The lady on the top left is Mira Sanyal. The man uh, at the bottom left is our own city, is Captain Gopinath. Uh, the lady in the center there is Malika Sarabhai. And the man on the bottom right is a gentleman called Arun Bhatia. Um, you may not know him very much, but he used to be an IAS officer, the municipal commissioner of Pune. And why I've placed them all on this particular slide is to illustrate the fact that these were middle-class icons, people who are professional, who have gone out there and in some cases, like Captain Gopinath, revolutionized the skies. And people with tremendous guts and commitment to their ideals, to their principles, Malika Sarabhai, right? And um, <coughs> able administrators, people who would be the darlings of the middle classes. And they contested from Mumbai South, Bangalore South, Gandhinagar, and Pune, four constituencies, which have the highest number of the urban educated middle classes. So how did they fare? Certainly, they're not in parliament, that much we know. But <laughs> if you just think about how well they might have done, well, here's the reality, right? So Meera Sanyal gets 1.5% of the vote. Malika Sarabhai gets just over 1%. Captain Gopinath, a little less than 2%. And Arun Bhatia crosses the 4% mark, all right? You know, they lost their deposits. This is the uh, ultimate ignominy in politics. Uh, anyway, basically why? Why do we see these kinds of outcomes? Why do we see these kinds of turnouts? You know, Captain Gopi is a close friend of mine. And, um, you know, I have participated in TV debates during this particular campaign as well. And I would tell him, look, boss, you can't just show up on election day and say you're going to save the world. You need to demonstrate a track record of public involvement. Anyway, so, but that's not really the issue. The issue really is why the educated middle classes seem to be behaving in this particular manner. And one simple answer is, you know, because they can. It doesn't matter. The political world does not matter. The educated middle classes dominate the government, not the political leadership perhaps, but the government that makes the country run the administrative service, you know, the bureaucracy, the civil services, they run business. The private sector now is certainly more full of the educated middle classes, and that's where many of you would aspire to go and work. And of course, the educated middle classes also dominate media. And so, in terms of influencing public policy, in, in terms of actually getting the results they want, they're getting them anyway. The Niradia tapes gave us a sense of, you know, the nexus, all the tentacles and how they're all interrelated, and how there's another world taking care of business out there that we don't even know about. Anyway, so if you can get what you want without too much effort, why bother with electoral politics? All that nonsense. Well, let's look back. And let's think about whether this has been the case throughout. Hardly. If you go back to the freedom movement, right, those people who were lucky enough to get a degree, to get an education, whether in India or in England, actually and, and, and ended up at the very forefront of the freedom movement. If you take the Nehru family, Motilal was a very flourishing lawyer, and his son was an England-educated lawyer as well. And when Jallianwala Bagh happened, they chucked their flourishing practices, their Western clothes and idiom, and plunged into the freedom movement. So that's the kind of leadership that we had at that time. And it's not as if that, you know, that engagement of the educated middle classes was just a one-shot event. Even in our generation, or a generation before, uh, ahead of us, we do see people who have embarked on public service and engagement with public causes. One path that some of them have taken is the Gandhian path, 
whether I mean, I'm just showing you Medha Patkar, but there are numerous people, including now Aruna Roy and people who fought for the right to information, people who went out into the villages and tried to make change at the grassroots. There were others who were inspired by Marx and Mao and went into the forests to organize the tribals and at the forefront of the Naxalite movement. Again, educated middle classes. And a phenomenon that we see much more of today is one where you have lots of people establishing or running or being involved with NGOs, civil society, as we like to call it. And there's one central feature about NGOs. They want to be apolitical, in the sense of being nonpartisan, not on one side or the other. And so they do engage with political issues, but by creating a platform. And I often tell them, look, if I had 100 of you, we could change the world. Why are you shying away from political engagement? It's not them alone. And I'm the Association for Democratic Reforms. One of my colleagues is actually involved in this. And they actually managed to bring about policy change to get the law to reflect the need for weeding out criminal elements. So that's the sort of work that they've been able to do and, you know, and impact policy outcomes. There's another group in Bangalore, which is very active, called Praja, which engages in lots of policy-related discussions. But everyone prefers to remain apolitical. But that's not everything. I am seeing signs of re-engagement. This started some years ago when Arjun Singh introduced reservations for other backward classes in uh, some of the elite institutions, we saw an outburst, an upsurge of protest, and the formation of a spontaneous organization called Youth for Equality. I have different views on the topic of reservation, but the point is this is an example of groups emerging and engaging in political demonstrations, in political mobilization. You can see this all over. And aided and abetted by especially English TV and English newspapers. Some years ago, when the Ram Sena attacked women in Mangalore and threatened to do the same thing in Bangalore, I organized a series of protest rallies across the city. And we managed to just overnight, using the internet, using mass media, managed to get huge numbers of people out on the streets, college students across the city, and even people in IT parks. Probably the first time any sort of political action had taken place in the sterile world of IT parks. But uh, that certainly is something that we managed to pull off. And that wasn't the only thing. At the same time, we had this extraordinarily innovative Facebook-driven protest called the Pink Chaddy Campaign, right? And that sort of stole the headlines. And you, know, you can see the kind of impact that they had. Anyway. That's not the only thing. These are all episodes leading to something else. And most recently, we've seen the educated middle classes you know, pour out onto the streets in support of Anna Hazare as part of India Against Corruption. And this is a fascinating development, because basically what you see here is people um, <clears throat> you know, having to import an icon, a Gandhian icon, someone they wouldn't want to spend two days with in his village, but essentially, uh, someone who could uh, you know, serve as a symbol to rally them all together. And you've seen all these pictures. And you also saw what happened in Mumbai when nobody showed up, right? So these are sporadic episodic instances, and no concrete long-lasting movement seems to emerge. What does everyone want to indulge in? They say, let's get a systemic fix. Let's get a strong Jan Lokpal bill, right? As if the institution is going to make all the difference, rather than the people. And that's really what I want to emphasize. If we want to change that political culture, we need to understand why it is the way it is, and our own role in making it the way it is. And we've got to understand why we need to step out of our comfort zones and get in there to bring about some kind of change in political culture. Many, many years ago, two decades and more now, when Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated, I was quite moved and sat down and wrote a poem one morning. 
And one part of it basically goes this way. Tell me, can anything be truer? As somberly we bid adieu. It's we who form the chakra vyuha for our own abhimanyu. For when culpability I do trace, the finger points straight at that enduring disgrace. India's wretched fate to her own people is due, who would carp and cavil, yet sacrifice a shoe, damning politics evil. It's us citizens who gave our country with nary a thought to every manner of knave while cursing the entire lot. When will we ever learn the basic simple truth? If India is not to burn, we each must contribute. And this really echoes, in some sense, a quotation that I came across a little later. This is an old uh, statement from Theodore Roosevelt, where he says that it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena. He calls for that. Get in there. And when you get in the arena, you'll discover that the political class is not all about those negative ideas that we saw earlier. There are people committed to public service. There are people with a passion for our issues and ideologies and development who devote full time to politics and to public service, who have empathy and courage and are willing to sacrifice and who, have, who are leaders who can inspire us. Just think of Gandhi, of Mandela. So those kinds of inspirations exist. But today, we are in denial. We deny that politics is a full-time commitment. If that's the case, how are politicians going to survive? How are they going to run their families? Elections cost money. Political parties running them cost money. Where's that going to come from? If it comes from an industrialist, 100 times more of our resources will be sold to them in return. What do we do? We say no to increasing a politician's salary. We want election spending limits to be enforced when they are unrealistic anyway, instead of finding newer ways to level the electoral, spend, uh, electoral playing field, such that we end up with only corrupt politicians who can survive and thrive. And none of us who want a better politics, a cleaner politics, is willing to spend a paisa to make that happen. We need to change this. We need to jump into this and contribute our ideas and time and energy either by being active politicians or by working with some causes without asking for something in return. It's not easy. It's very, very difficult and unstructured. There's no guarantee of success, I know. But we have to keep going on with it. And let me tell you, people tell me, you know what? Two generations ago, of course, there was a freedom movement going on. Therefore, people participated. Today, there's nothing like that. And I say, well, you heard of Amartya Sen? Have you heard of his concept of development as freedom? Where he says 1947 was just political freedom. True freedom is when each and every individual can live up to his or her potential. That means freedom from poverty, from illiteracy, from ill health, the ability to hold your head high against social discrimination, the ability to make your own choices. Are we free from poverty, from ill health, from illiteracy? Hardly. Then there are many more freedom movements to fight. And we've all got to get in there and do something and participate and contribute. And only then will we be able to transform that corrupt Indian political culture and the apathetic culture of India's educated middle classes. Thank you.